All right, this is Exodus chapter 12. You know what's really funny is I wasn't intending to do this, but it just kind of happens as I'm reading through the scriptures and I'm learning things. And this is the famous first Passover story of God when he delivers the people of Israel from the people of Egypt. There are just a few things that stick out. Only three of them that I want to give you. I'm only doing half a chapter 12 today because it's important. Let me remind you of where we are. The nine plagues have come. Darkness covered the face of Egypt for three days. Moses has announced to Pharaoh that the Lord is making a distinction between the Egyptians and the Israelites. Moses then communicates to the people of Israel God's standard for this Passover lamb. First and foremost, he's establishing a whole new calendar based upon what he's about to do in Egypt. He tells each family that the whole community of Israel on the 10th day of the month must choose a lamb or a young goat for a sacrifice, one animal for each household. The first thing that I got out of this text is God's deliverance in Egypt is personal, but it's not private. Just like our relationship with God is personal, but it's not private. Verse four, if a family is too small to eat the whole animal, let them share with another family in the neighborhood. Well, think about that. God himself, in establishing a whole new calendar for his people Israel, says, hey, if your house is too small to eat that whole lamb, go and grab somebody else. I can't help but think of love your neighbor as yourself. Treat other people the way you want to be treated. That Christianity is a communal faith. It is a collectivistic kingdom. It is not an individualistic kingdom. So it's personal, but it's not private. No, it's extended to the entire community. And so then the text says in verse 3, a lamb. Verse 5 says the animal you select. And then verse 6 says, take special care of this chosen animal until the evening of the 14th day of the first month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter their lamb. So it becomes even more personal. First you choose any of them, but then the one you choose becomes yours. And so as I look at this text and I think about Christianity and I think about the way that we're supposed to live as believers, there are many times where we say things like, my personal Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and he is our personal Lord and Savior. But I think sometimes we also miss that he is our Lord and Savior, that we are family. The individualistic nature of the Christianity that I hear about today that I've been a part of, that I myself have said, my personal Lord and Savior, and talked about praying the prayer to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. While that stuff is important because he is personal, he's not private. And there are people who act like Christianity is something that you can hide in a corner or in a closet or shit. No, it's personal, but it's not private. It's extended to your community, just as the Passover lamb is extended to the whole community. The way that the Lord tells them to eat, verse 11, be fully dressed, wear your sandals, and carry your walking stick in your hand. Eat it with urgency, for this is the Lord's Passover. Why would he tell them to eat it like this? Why would he tell them to scoff it down quickly? God is showing them what it looks like to walk by faith. See, if they were just chilling and eating it in their night clothes like it didn't matter, God was saying, no, 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 no. You are taking part in this celebratory feast as your last meal in Egypt before you get out of here. And so eat it because you know you're getting out of here. Let me also say this. Always celebrate freedom from slavery. The Lord says in verse 14, this is a law for all time. So God, in their deliverance from Egypt, even before he delivers them, he sets up a law that says you must make this the first of the month and you sell it, or the first of the year, and you celebrate this first month of the first year of, of, of Israel's deliverance from Egypt with the Passover. Why would God do that? Because he never wants them to forget slavery. He never wants them to forget his deliverance by his powerful hand. He never wants them to forget what they've been through because he doesn't want them to reproduce that anywhere else. He doesn't want them to forget, so he tells them to commemorate with this feast at the first of every year. Hey, it sets you up for the rest of the year. It sets you up to be reminded of what you went through, what you got delivered from, 
and what you have been delivered to. You are not only free from slavery, but you're free to this new relationship with God, whereby he is your God and you are his people. Then the Bible says, but the blood, verse 13, on your doorpost will serve as a sign marking the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. When the sacrifice of the Passover is made, God promises that he is going to overlook whatever is happening in the house as long as he sees the blood. Now, I got I to gotta spend a little time on this one because this is important. But the blood on your doorpost will serve as a sign marking the houses where you stay. When I see the blood, I will pass over. Verse 23, when he sees the blood on the top and sides of the door frame, the Lord will pass over your home. He will not permit his death angel to enter your house and strike you down. Somebody might say, but that girl in that house lying it doesn't matter because he sees the blood. But do you know the people who are in that? It doesn't matter because he sees the blood. Do you know what they're doing, what they've done? Do you know who they've been to? doesn't matter because he sees the blood. The Bible here tells us that the, and it's a picture, a prophetic parallel of Jesus. When God sees the blood, then God will pass over because he sees the blood, because they have by faith believed in the atoning substitutionary sacrifice of this lamb. And its blood is then uh, spread with hyssop. The Bible says in verse 22 brush the hyssop across the top of sides of at uh, top and sides of the door frames of your houses no one may go out through the door until the morning so the idea is they're going to lock themselves in the house and they're going to put blood all over the doorpost the blood of the lamb that they've eaten and so god will pass over because he's promised to pass over i'm reminded as i read brush the hyssop across the top psalm 51 verse 7 Purge me with hyssop that I might be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. The blood of Jesus is the only cure for our sin and our shame and our guilt before a holy God. The blood of Jesus is the only cure for any ill that we experience. I think people forget you cannot legislate out sin. That does not mean policies don't need to change. Please don't get me wrong. I'm more so saying even if policy changes, Jesus said, the poor you'll always have with you. Why did he say that? Well, because sin and the curse will continue to be pervasive. Evil men will get, will get worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived, ever learning, never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's what the Bible teaches. That said, what is the cure? What should we preach? We should preach that God created all men in his image and after his likeness, that man sinned by eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that God made a way through the blood of his son and gave us plenty of examples to recognize him when he came. Jesus was killed right at Passover. And so they should have caught it immediately that the Passover lamb, the Lord Jesus Christ, was the one whose blood was shed for the sin of everyone. Without the shedding of blood, almost all things, Hebrews 9.22 says, are purged with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. God shed his blood in order that we might be forgiven. And in our forgiveness, in our reconciliation to God, he also, according to the book of Ephesians, reconciled us to one another. That doesn't mean that when I'm a believer, I will never, ever sin again. What it means is God doesn't count my sin against me. Just as when I'm a believer, am I reconciled to every other believer? Sure. Are we family? Absolutely. But that doesn't mean there won't be such a thing as dissonance. That doesn't mean there won't be such a thing as us not understanding one another or, or having issues with one another. And so I need to do the hard work of continually looking in the mirror myself, asking the Lord, Lord, search me, try me, know me if there's any wicked way in me. If there's any place where I am not treating others the way that I would desire to be treated. If there's any place where I am putting something next to you, God, or, or right there with you. Somebody said that, that people will be real disappointed when they get to heaven and see that there's no American flag and that Jesus doesn't have a picture of the founding fathers on his desk. And, and I laughed. But the thing is, some people will hear that and actually be shocked. I was, I was telling this joke that, that people say if the King James was good, good enough for Peter and Paul, it's good enough for me. And, mo and a lot of people, because they believe that the King James is the only word of God, I, I'm not trying to be offensive or divisive. I'm just saying there are tons of beliefs that we have 
that are not biblical beliefs that we purport every single day because we've got them from something other than filtering everything we believe through God's word. That said, the blood of Jesus is the only cleansing factor for all of us. That does not mean Timotheus Pope is infallible. No, I know that I'm fallible. That's why I continue to filter everything through the word. I know I can get it wrong. Hey, listen, I can get my interpretation of the word wrong if I'm not listening to the Holy Spirit. If I'm listening to what, what I think about the word versus what God says about the word, then I can get that wrong too. So I have to continue to, Lord, search me, try me, know me. If there's anything, any wicked way in me, Lord, just, just show me. In your word, that's the word of God. That's what the word of God does. And so I'm hoping that you're encouraged by the reality that your relationship with God, my relationship with God is our relationship with God is personal, but it's not private. That he always wants us to celebrate freedom from slavery. And Jesus has set us free from sin by his blood. His promise of salvation comes through his blood. And it doesn't matter what they've done in the house. It doesn't matter what they're doing in the house. Because ultimately, God is not passing over based upon their actions. He's passing over based upon the, the blood. And somebody will say, well, if they don't put the blood on the door, I mean, that's a work, that's an action. Oh, I get that completely. Do I understand we must believe this gospel by faith? Yes. However, guess what? Without God initiating this law, without God initiating the commemoration of, and the celebratory feast of the Passover, that, that blood wouldn't mean anything. But because God made a promise, that blood doesn't just mean anything. It means everything. And I pray to God that the blood of Jesus means everything to you. That means more than your political party. That the blood of Jesus means more than the country in which you live. That the blood of Jesus means more in the county in which you live. The blood of Jesus means more to you than anything. The blood of Jesus means more to you than anything or anyone. That's why Jesus says, if anyone will come after me and does not hate his own mother and father, sister and brother, wife and children, yes, even his own life, Luke 14, verse 26 and 27, he cannot be my disciple. I think what Jesus means is if you don't love me more than anyone or anything else, I have nothing to teach you because I've loved you more than anyone or anything else. He loved us more than he loved his own life and he gave himself for us in order that we might know him and be in relationship with him. Let that be an encouragement to you today. If you ever question whether or not God loves you, whether or not you matter, man, God killed his own son for you. God wrote this love letter for you and for me that we might love him and love each other in community. This is a collectivistic faith. This is a collectivistic, a communal kingdom. God is so one-on-one. -on -one, and yet at the same time, he made us a family, a body, a building, and his bride. Be encouraged by that today. Love you. Peace.